take a deep breath. Shake your arms out a little bit. Shake your nalgas out a little bit. There you go. Go ahead and have a seat. See, most people, when they think about history, often think about history as being a very serious thing, or often will think about history as being primarily about dates. And the reality is, for history to be interesting, it's about people. It's about people's lives. It's about how people have interacted with each other. And I have to say that this is an exciting time for me because I've never, ever, ever done one of my talks or lectures where translation has been available. And so thank you, All Saints. I want to make sure I get this right. Thank you, Latino, Hispanic ministry at All Saints, because this is what should be happening. Um, when we know our roots, we're more comfortable moving ahead. When we know the roots and stories that we've shared, we can better support each other as we're moving along. My husband, who's James, over there, wave hi. There you go. <laughs> he gets applause for being himself, that's good. So he and I moved here about 35 years ago. And when we first moved here, we were really excited. We got into our little house, we opened up the yellow pages, and on the back of the yellow pages, we saw that our mayor was a woman who was black. Right? Anybody know who that was? Yeah. Who is it, Alma? Glickman. That's right. Loretta Glickman Thompson. Yeah. That's right. And we were really, really excited. And one of the things that was encouraging for us about being here in Pasadena was there was so much evidence of the history of the black community. It felt really, really wonderful to see that being shared. What I didn't know for 15 years was that there had been a Latino community here, as they say in Spanish, desde cuando, you know? since forever, sort of. Some of the work that I was doing had, had me begin to interact with elders. And so some of these were folks whose families had been here three generations, four generations, and five generations. And I began to learn their stories. And there was a group of us that got together and put together the Latino Heritage Parade in Jamaica. And every year, almost every year, we would have a theme that was of a particular era. And when that era came up, we would explore and we would have conversations with those that had lived a long time here. And I began to learn that there was a very, very rich history that was here. And that was actually how I came to write the book Latinos in Pasadena which is coming up on its 10th anniversary, which seems really wacky, but there you go. One of the things that's very exciting to me about today's talk is that it's really focused on the women. It's on the Latinas, the Latinx that have been here in Pasadena. Um, I'll just begin now, and we'll take our way through, and every time, I, if once in a while I've been told to uh, give a signal that we're going to move on. And this is like the ride back that used to be at Disneyland. Here we go. I want to start off, as I do with every talk, by acknowledging the first peoples that were here before all of the rest of us. Uh, Toy Purina was a young woman. She was a shaman. She was perhaps a curandera, certainly a leader. And if you look at the map on your left, each of those dots represents a community, a clan, or a family that was in the area. It was a very active area. There was a lot of trade that went on. The Toy Purina, part of the reason we know about her is because she ended up at the mission. She hated the priests. She hated the way she was treated, and she led a revolt. She was among those that led a revolt. 
And she came, the reason we know this is because it's possible to read the transcript of what she said in front of the judges, as it were, about how she felt, about how her people were being treated, and how concerned she was. She was married off and was sent up north and was no longer a part of the San Gabriel Mission. Here's an image done by a fellow by the last name Walker. Michael Smith, no, Michael Smith. This watercolors, and what I wanted to share with you about this is that San Gabriel Mission was the richest of all of the missions. And the reason it was so rich was because it had water flowing through it. If you think about it, um, the water from the arroyo would come down, go down to the mission. They had orchards, they had vineyards, they had all sorts of animals that could eat and produce tallow. Remember that from your fourth grade class? Could produce tallow and had all of that skin that was being used. It was a, an economy that was based on space, on animals being able to roam, and this was the richest of all of the missions. Santa Barbara may have been the cutest, but this was the one that had the bars. <laughs> So this woman, to, to your left, Eulalia Perez Guillén de Mariné. So Eulalia Perez, we know about her because her oral history was taken down in 1877. Hugh Bancroft sent Thomas Savage out here to interview her. Now one of the things that's interesting about Doña Eulalia in reading her biography, in reading this memoir, is that um, she talks about the fact that her father taught her how to read. She was literate. The family tradition has that she was literate. And she was born in Baja, and then she married a soldier at about age 14 or 15. She began to have children, and as still happens with folks that are in the military, up and down the coast she went. So from Baja, she go to San Diego when it was first being started, Mission San Diego and the Presidio when it was first being started. And then she went up to San Juan Capistrano and San Gabriel and then back on down. And in 1812, she was pregnant. She was huge with child and the great earthquake of 1812 struck. The tower fell down. It was, it's huge. Those of you that have an interest in earthquakes, read about it, because it's a huge one. Um, the tower fell down, and she eventually crawled out of the rubble with her child and being pregnant. And I think that speaks something of who this woman was. Eventually, she became a widow. She came to the San Gabriel Mission. And she won her position as a cook at the mission through a cooking contest. So you can think of chopped, you know, like only the 19th century version. But one of the things that's been interesting is looking at her memoir again. Part of the reason she won was not only because she was such a fine cook, but also because the priests were looking to see which of the three women that were in this contest could best teach the Indians how to cook. And in fact, the Indian that was busy observing her while she was cooking, his name was Tomas. Not necessarily his birth name, but that was the name he was given. And they asked Tomas, so of these three women, which one was the easiest to work with? Which one was the best teacher? Which one knew the, the, the most? And Tomas said, Eolalia. This was a wonderful thing for Eolalia because she was a widow. She had children and she needed a job. Over the years, she began to be essentially the COO of the mission. She was the llavera. She was encargada de todo. You needed the, the neophytes to come in inside? Okay. Somebody else is going to count them, but then they would report to her. You have yardage that you need for your vaqueros, 
de caballo. Okay, she's going to find out who it is. You have the other ones that are not the caballo. They're on a mule or something like that. She was also responsible for that. She was responsible for overseeing the oil, the, let's see, what was the material? I'm sorry, every once in a while it's interesting hearing the Spanish. Um, hearing the, the material. And she even is purported to have invented lemonade. Okay. Now, how do I know all of this, right? Is it something magical? No, you can go online and look at the English translation of this, and I encourage you to do so. Because you find out about what her life was like, what her interactions were like with um, her daughters, and what her interactions were like with, some, and what some of the interaction was like with the Indians that were there at the mission. Some of it was good, some of it was really bad, and it's in there and her response to how that is, is also in there. Doña Eulalia was purported to live to 143. Only 112. <laughs> Any of you that are familiar with the California colony of Indiana, the Indiana colony, they knew about Doña Eulalia. Lucky Baldwin knew about Eulalia. Um, she was married twice. The second time was um, at the encouragement of the priest, one of the priests at the mission. She didn't really want to get married to him, but she said that that priest had been so good to me. He'd been like a mother and father to me, and I couldn't say no to him. And so um, they got married, and... When, uh, well, actually, when the mission lands were secularized, when the missions had, when the church had to give up their lands, Rancho El Rincón de San Pascual was reserved for her. So, all the way to the east wall of the Arroyo, going over to Sierra Madre, a mile up north of Altadena in the foothills, and all the way down into South Pasadena, the parts of San Marino, this hall was reserved for Luna Eulalia. Okay. She's a fantastic woman, and most people don't know about her. Um, so this is one of those ways I'm, I'm excited about doing this and weaving her story back in. If you look on the simpler design, the diseño, that was the um, document that was showing where her land was. With the happening of the War of 1848, the U.S.-Mexican War, things changed, governments changed, the 49ers got here, things changed again. She did not keep the land. Okay? The land moved on, and Manuel Garfias became the next owner of Rancho de Rincón de San Pascual. These are Las Doñas de Rancho de San Pascual. Had a little name change. The Avila Adobe down in Los Angeles by Olvera Street, that's what Doña Encarnación looks like and that's where she lived. Her daughter married Manuel Garfias and that's Luisa on the left. And so these were women that had connections with making sure that Rancho El Rincón de San Pascual remained within their family. This is another, there were, there were not a lot of super uh, centenarians, I guess it is, or I'm forgetting, those that lived over 100 years. But you know the Verdugo Hills? This is one of the Verdugos. When you think about the foothills, when you think about Rubio, when you think about these different places, there were people and families that lived up there. And um, this was a woman who lived till about 1928. Um, that's, that's a long life. That's a long life. When I first started doing uh, research, this is one of the first images that I found. And it's a Mexican-American dwelling in the Arroyo, 1897. We don't often think about it, but there were homesteaders and squatters and pioneers that were up here just as there were in Oklahoma. 
people would come, they would set up their formal papers, some of them, the squatters didn't, um, and they lived there. Um, and this woman, we don't know who she is, we'll probably never have her name, but we know she was there in 1897. And somebody who had a camera in 1897 found her interesting enough to take a picture. It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's not a tree, it's this woman. Speaking of homesteaders, Carlos R. Cruz was somebody who was over in the Eaton Canyon area. He had been born in California, came down from Northern California, and um, bought land, essentially homesteaded land, up in Eaton Canyon. And if you go to Eaton Canyon, there used to be the possibility of seeing this map that has or the boundaries with the various colors, and you could see where his, his land was. Now the reason I mention Carlos Cruz is because we're now entering into an era where we lose women's names. We know his, one of his wives was named Rita, but we don't know anything much more about her than that. And I'm hoping at some point or the other, if I don't get to do it, there's somebody out here that begins to explore, so who was Rita? Where did she come from? You know? These were people that had, uh, many of them had been living here when it was Mexico. And then following the U.S.-Mexican War, they became American citizens. So their names are on the census somewhere. And if your name is on a census, you get a little bit of information to work on. And then there are the allies that exist. Technically, these people are not Latinos, right? Helen Elliott Bandini. Remember, I was mentioning the Indiana colony of, of, of rather California colony of Indiana. Okay. So when they came out here. They were very forward-thinking, they were suffragists, they were abolitionists, um, hardcore suffragists. So much so that um, the, her parents, Helen Elliott's uh, parents, had owned at least two properties. One of them went into foreclosure. The paper, the prefab paper, the, the document, the court document that came out, typically says, Mr. Leave the Blank and his wife and fill in the blank, they crossed off Mr., entered Mrs., entered the wife's name, crossed off wife, and added husband. And we're talking about 1878, something like that. So these are very hardcore people. And these are all pe also people that are interested we're used to and we're blessed to be in a situation where we enjoy each other's company. These folks were coming from Indiana and all of a sudden they're seeing cactus. My gosh, that's an exciting thing to see. They've never seen cactuses before. You know, they're looking at the plains and they're meeting these people, these people that they've never met before, some of whom are speaking this language that they've never heard before. And this group, most of the members of this group, are really excited. Who are these people? Where did they come from? Helen Elliott Bandini marries the son of Juan Bandini, who is the last Secretary of State to Pio Pico, the last Mexican governor. They were married over at the, where we now have the Ninth Circuit Court. They uh, lived together and had the first really pivotal green and green that was over by Caltech. It was called Rancho Hogar. She loved things Mexicano. She loved things Californiano. Okay, and the difference being this kind of romanticized. There's Christine Lofstedt, which is a real Mexicana name, right? She's from Minnesota, she's Swedish. But she came out here and in 1922, for her master's thesis at USC, she wrote the state of the Mexican population in the city of Pasadena. 
And so through these two women, we have information that we would not have otherwise. They were able to explore areas that people that were empowered really may not have cared about or they didn't know. They may not have had interaction. You wonder why the street not too far from here is called Walnut. We had, yes. And this, this image comes from the Museum of History. And as you can see, then, just as now, familias often are working together in the field, working hard. And this begins to speak, I think, of the idea of legacies. You can have a legacy of talent. You can have a legacy of fortune. You can have a legacy of determination and of commitment to family. And that's part of what I see when I'm looking at this image here. Okay. Maria Guadalupe Evangelina Lopez de Lauzo. Is that a mouthful, right? Say that three times. <laughs> so, there was a, a book written by Carson Anderson using information from the city of Pasadena about 1994-1995. And it's an ethnic history research project. And among the things he has in there, he's looking at the different ethnic and racial groups that are here in Pasadena, or were here in Pasadena at that time. So there's information on Norwegians, there's information on Swedes, and Greeks, and Italians, and Blacks, and Chinese, and Japanese, and Mexican, Mexicanos. Um, and so this is one of the first names that I came across. And I was curious because this young girl graduated in 1902 or 1903, went to Pasadena High School. Okay, so any of you there of HS get excited about her? She went to Pasadena High School and she graduated, went on to normal school, which is a teacher school, and was the youngest professor at USC. She was busy teaching language, which is not too surprising. She later went on to UCLA. I don't know whether or not she got mixed emotions about that. She went on to UCLA and she worked as a translator for a lot of volumes, hardcore, botanical sorts of volumes. When she graduated from uh, PHS, her major was scientific. She also played the piano. She also was somebody who sometimes went by the name Maria, or Eva, or Lupe, depending on the time. And I think depending upon the circle with whom she was interacting. Because at that time, it's important to remember that some people were not as welcoming as that California colony of Indiana, right? And so maybe you want to be Mary, because it makes life a little bit easier which is kind of a sad thing, but a real thing that happens. Um, she returned, after she retired, to San Gabriel. She lived in La Casa Vieja. If you ever go on the tour of the San Gabriel Mission, you'll see there's that little low adobe. She lived there. Um, and she actually was very involved in the redevelopment. So the way the streets look, between the mission and just right before it curves around to get back to Huntington, I think it is. She was involved with that. Here's the one guy I said we'd have a picture of. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm not forgetting you. Abelemio or Abelamio Hernandez. Now, what do you notice about him and or what he has? I think you can see it. Hatamales, okay? Back in the day, about this is about 1910, people would go down the streets, they say, ice, get your ice, fruit, get your tamales, in Pasadena, okay? So why is he here? because we don't know where we have a picture of Rita. And I bet you, Rita Hernandez was busy making tamales. 
Rita and her friends, Rita and her cousins, Rita and quien sabe quien. The comadres were in there doing the business. But this is the face that we have. And so that's, again, thinking about Latinas and their legacies. This is one of those things to keep in mind. Okay, so there's the guy. Is there a gal? The difference that begins to take place in the 20s, Amelia Hernandez and her friends, this is one of those things when I show young people, I tell them, okay, think about what that family looked like at the Pasadena sewer farm, picking walnuts, right? Long skirt, long sleeves, trenza, you know, nice happy trenza. Look at these wild girls. You can see their shoulders. <laughs> You could probably see their knees, you know? They've got their hairs cut in, in a bob. And, and there is some assimilation, acculturation that's taking place. They're probably lis listening to Lydia Mendoza and to jazz because they're here in Pasadena, they're here in the States. One of the things that is, um, was, has been lost in the telling is that the two established segregated schools in Pasadena were Mexican schools. There were segregated Mex Mexican schools that existed throughout Southern California and the Southwest. Anaheim, El Monte, Monrovia. They were established and the feeling what very strongly was that, um, and there are documents that support this, that they were only going to be domestics. So there was no need for them to learn how to read or to write really well. What they needed to do, if people were being charitable to them, because I mean, some people were thinking of this in a very positive way, some people wanted to keep them in their place, was they should learn how to cook for groups. So these are fourth graders at one of the two segregated schools, Junipero Serra, um, and they are learning how to cook for people. That is their education for the day. The schools seem to increase Junipero Serra's population, kept getting larger and larger and larger, and then we hit about the 1930s, 1931 and they closed the school. And the reason they closed the school is because they don't have enough children. And part of the reason they don't have enough children is because this is the same time that the deportations and repatriations are taking place across the United States. And from Pasadena alone, there were 431 people that were shipped out. One of the families um, that lived here, um, they went down to Mexico. They went to a place which was very arid. It was an awful experience for them. Mom and dad had uh, uh, gave birth, mom gave birth to a child that was there while they were there. And one of the children who had been born um, here died in Mexico. When the family was able to come back to the United States, that child's body was left in Mexico. They couldn't bring it across. And the family had to fight to get the child who'd been born in Mexico to be able to come back to the United States. The complexities that we're seeing now with DACA, with DREAMers, is something that's been a long-term problem. On the plus side, we had several groups that would get together and try and figure out, okay, so what are some ways that we can employ people, that we can have people doing things? Keeping in mind that we're still kind of living in a very gendered way. So what could the mujeres do? They were part of the cooperative laundry because women knew how to wash and do that sort of thing. Zooming along, because now we're in the 1940s, we're at Pasadena Junior College. And this is the Xochimilco Club. And the Xochimilco Club 
is one of the groups that works really hard. Its mission is to essentially interact and inform people about the good things about Mexican Americans. This is happening at about the same time the Zoot Suit Riots are taking place. The other thing I'd like to mention with this is that many of the people that are in this image, the women, are women that later on became active in groups like COPA, which was originally Chicanas Organized for Progress and Advancement, Pasadena Scholarship Committee, and other organizations that were uh, connected with the city. We also had the Guadalupanas. This was over at Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission Church. Not only did we have segregated schools, we had segregated churches. And Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission Church was on Raymond and California. And it burnt down some time ago. And over time it developed an interesting position in that not only did you have the Mexicanos and Mexican Americans, and at that point beginnings of Chicanos, that were there, but it's right near Millionaire's Road. And so you had some folks, like the Bogards, that went to Our Lady of Guadalupe Mission Church. 1974. Do you see that turtleneck on that person to the right slightly? Okay. That makes her look more feminine. This is Marilyn Diaz, and she had to wear that because she had to look more feminine when she was off on patrol. It's okay. She was the first woman directly appointed patrol. She was the first Latina commander in the Pasadena Police Department. She was the first woman to become chief of the Sierra Madre Police Department and one of the very, very few women in the state of California. Jesusita Mijares. I'm sorry. I love that she can say that. Slow down. Jesusita Mijares. Who has ever eaten at Mijares? Raise your hand. Here's another woman who is an entrepreneur, came here and at various times was a widow, but she was a businesswoman. She began by selling tamales. I don't know if she knew Rita or not. And eventually, Mijares uh, grew to be the restaurant that it was, is. And um, when it burned down, there was a second Mijares that was set up over on Washington Boulevard, and she was enough of a business person, her family was enough of a business person, or people, that they were able to reestablish Mijares. Julie Gutierrez, third generation Pasadena. Her father was the first Latino who was appointed to the POSD board. And the interesting story on that is, at the time, Latinos were 10% of the city of Pasadena. L.B. Hickenbottom, who was seated um, on the school board at that time, was aware that uh, actually one of the board members was upset with this whole kind of do sex stuff and left, and so left an open seat. And there was a seat to be filled. Working with Chicanos and Mexicanos in the community, L.B. Hickenbottom placed Filomón Gutierrez's name to be on the school board. Marge Wyatt seconded that, and that was how the first Latino came to be on the Pasadena Unified School District Board. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Julie, if you look at this, you can see all of the departments over which she is responsible, acts as liaison. Her college major was drama. <laughs> no, theater administration, which actually makes sense, right? <laughs> Angelica Salas, executive, executive director at Shirla. Um, she has lived here for a long time and has worked tirelessly not only to 
develop Chirla into the organization that it is now, but to help um, see opportunities and encourage empowerment of those they are serving to be able to find their own voices, express their voices, and demand change that needs to take place. Adriana Ocampo. Yeah, she is a doctora. She began her career as a high school student at JPL and eventually became known as one of the top 50 women scientists in the United States. She is now with NASA and um, she actually was one of the first keynote speakers at the President's Latino Advisory Committee scholarship dinner some years ago. Yeah, go ahead. Lydia Lopez, she's a powerhouse. There's just no, no other way to do that, to talk about her. She became involved in the Chicano movement and then she was very involved in sanctuary work. And she continues to be a voice to be heard and to encourage those that don't know um, what the needs might be, what some of those needs, how they might be filled. She's also somebody that at one point I said, Lydia, you know, I would love to recognize Doña Eulalia. She said, okay, let's go. And, you know, maybe I'll call on her again so that we can. Susana Guzman, opera singer, was recently in a mariachi opera, also a Pasadena gal. She began to learn how to sing um, in a rock band across from Central Park. And then we have our young Rose Queen, our most recent Rose Queen, and Leana Yamasaki who was the first Latina Rose Queen. And you say, wait a minute. Well, her family is, I believe, from Peru. And we have many Chinese and Japanese that moved there for a variety of reasons. And so I end with this image. So what do we need to do? What do you need to do? in order to encourage or make available the history of some of these Latinas that we've talked about today to the little girls that are coming up and just beginning to have fun and express and find their own identity. Thank you.